this video looked mildly interesting. So I'm gonna look at this video because it looked mildly interesting. This video is called nothing. It is called nothing because YouTube has decided not to give me a title. So I don't know who made this video, when they made this video. It's just not there. I thought it was gonna show up when the video, okay, hold on. How fish survive hydro turbines. So this is from an engineering perspective, but I thought it'd be interesting to look at it from a fish perspective. The US were built before we really understood the impacts they would have on river ecosystems, or at least they were built before we were caught. That's an understatement. And basically, not even basically, how when was the last time like non-practical dams have been built? It's been a while. We just were like, holy crap, water, make power, free power, build dam and get free power. And then built 10 billion of them everywhere. And then 10 years later, we're like, oh man, all the migratory fish are dying. Wonder what that's about. Conscientious enough to weigh those impacts against the benefits of a dam. And to be fair, it's hard to overstate those benefits. Flood control, agriculture, water supply for cities, and hydroelectric power. All of our yes, I am not purely anti-dam. Some people are purely anti-dam. Uh, just like, I, I understand. I think there is a very reasonable compromise that we have yet to figure out because we frankly have not put enough money or time into it that can coexist where dams can, fish can get past dams and the dams have basically very little ecosystem impact. I think it has to be the right areas with the right species and with the right measures built into the dam to assist the native ecosystem. So I think it's very difficult to do. And I don't think we're in a good, like we're in a good place right now. We haven't done enough research to really understand how to do it, but I think it will actually potentially long-term with more effort into it will be good. But those benefits come at a cost. Salmon. And the price isn't just the dollars we spent on the infrastructure, but also the impacts dams have on the environment. But even though most of these big dams were built decades ago, the ways we manage that struggle are constantly evolving <laughs> as the science and engineering improve. To say it's evolving, I guess is true. It is improving. There are studies being done. It is still severely underfunded to have fish passages on dams. We like, we're like, hey, maybe we should have fish passages on dams. We came up with a bunch of different theories on how we could do it. We tested like two of them with effective methods, failed to really make any good conclusions. The one that I worked on, so I worked looking at the fish passage within a dam. So I looked at a window and fish would pass and I would identify them. And we were trying to see the effectiveness of the dam, right? And this dam was not effective. Like, but you wouldn't even know that just even by monitoring that, you wouldn't know how many fish tried to make it through but didn't. So even with my job where we had a fish passage on a dam and we're monitoring it 24 seven to see what fish came through, we still were not doing it efficiently and had no way to measure because we don't know how many fish tried to get into the passage and then, or how many fish were below the dam and couldn't even find the passage in the first place. No, like there is just a lot of research and improvement that needs to be done. To say that we're improving is true, but my God, is it slow and people just don't care. It Right now, it's really like we're in a blitz anti-dam where we tear down all of the old dams, which fair enough, if they're serving no purpose or very little purpose, get rid of them. But we're just not making much progress or as much as I would like to see in terms of fish passages. There is a well-designed fish passage that can work. I guarantee it. Humans are smart enough. We can come up with something. We're just not really trying as hard as we should be. So I wanted to see for myself how we strike a balance between a dam's benefits and environmental impacts and how that's changing over time. So I partnered up with the folks at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory or PNNL in Washington State to learn more. They showed me so much, not just the incredible technology and research cool. that goes on in the lab, but also Fish how gel. it's put into practice in Jesus. the infrastructure in the field. I've never also, seen I the inside of a dam. I mean, I imagine this is a very large dam, but that's still crazy. Could share it with you. Could get a bunch of drones to pick up each fish and lift them across the dam. You know, you're trying. I, good job. Humans try, and that's why we get good at things. Salmon. Yeah, this is literally what I worked at. I would sit 
well, at home, I watched a video, but there was a camera set on one of these windows, which was a passage along the side of a dam, and the camera just recorded 24-7, and I would go through 24 hours of footage watching it at like 30 times speed and identify whatever fish came through. But like, is no minnows ever came through. The only fish capable of making it were like big fish. The passage was just really poor. Like they had to be very strong. The, the, the dam that I worked at, like the fish passage was a series of pools, like a step system. So the fish had to climb to one pool, then climb to the next pool, then climb, you know, with the water flowing in between them, right? Which seems simple enough, but the way that it was designed was so poor that it created a whirlpool in each individual pool. So like in each step, you had to you were being spun around like this because of the way that the flow is. Yeah, that is where the bass had the back malformation that I made that video about. So basically you had like, it was like an American Ninja Warrior obstacle course to get through this fish passage. Because not only did you have to go up five steps and down the tunnel after finding the passage in the first place, but each step involved like being inside of a whirlpool. So the only fish that ever made it were like, big fish, like big game fish or quillback or that kind of thing, or eels and lamprey. They would make it a good amount as well because I guess they're less affected because they're so eely. Nary is equipped with a host of facilities meant to help wildlife get from one side to the other with as little stress or injury as possible. Let's look at the fish ladders first. McNary has two of them. One now on see, each. that is a better fish ladder. That is literally just a tunnel that fish can swim up. Now, are minnows gonna make make it up that? Probably not. But minnows also aren't typically migratory in most parts, so that's less of a concern. But just like a one long channel, there's no step system, you're not creating any weird flows. This is obviously a much better system. Side. A big contingent of the fish needing past McNary Dam are adult salmon and other species from the ocean trying to get upstream to reproduce in fresh Eels, streams. lamprey, etc. They are biologically motivated to swim against the current, so a fish ladder is designed to encourage and allow them to do just that. And it starts with attraction water. In addition to a strong current, salmon are sensitive to the sound and motion of splashing water, so that's just what we do. I did not know that. I did not know that fish ladders utilized multiple ways of attracting the fish. I've always wondered about that, of like, how do they find the passage? Again, the dam that I worked on certainly did not do this. And I questioned out of probably thousands of fish who reached the bottom of the dam, how many of them actually found the passage in the first place. Not to mention how many of them couldn't get through it, but even saw that it existed in the first place. So at least for salmon, there's some way of motivating and attracting them to enter the passage. At McNary, huge electric pumps lift water from the tail race below the dam and discharge it into a channel that runs along the powerhouse. As the water splashes back down, it draws fish toward the entrances so they can orient with the flow through the ladder. All these entrances provide options for the fish to come in, increasing the opportunity and likelihood that they'll find their way. Between the regulating weirs on the north end, regulating weirs on the south end, and those floating orifices here, you back up that water. You're using a massive amount of water to keep that step, yeah. that whole portal in. I see. Once they're in, they So make... there's like a multiple... Yeah. This is going to sound insane because I'm a fish biologist watching a scientific video, but the greatest thing that I compare this to, and maybe someone in chat will understand, is an iron golem farm in Minecraft. <laughs> This is going to sound ridiculous, but the way that you have like the spawners and then you have the flows going one way and then that flows into a separate channel, it's just the reverse of that. So you have a horizontal flow along the front face of the dam that they'll enter, orient themselves upwards to enter the, the ladder on the other, you know, the water flowing on the other side. It's literally a... <laughs> Okay, like five people in chat understood, so I don't feel as bad anymore, but it's literally how you make like the farms in Minecraft where you have the water flow into the next water flow into the next water flow, except they're going up that. So you just have to, which is harder to do in real life because water in real life doesn't flow like it does in Minecraft, but the same idea. Make their way upstream into the ladder itself. Concrete baffles break up the insurmountable height of the dam into manageable sections that fish can swim up at their own pace. Most of the fish go through holes in the baffles, but some jump over the weirs. There's even a window near the top of the ladder where an expert is that a shad? The fish and no, identifies a their species. 
This data is important to a wide variety That's what I did. of organizations, and it's even posted online if you want to have a look. Once at the top, the fish pass through a trash rack that keeps debris out of the ladder and continue their journey to their spawning grounds. The goal is that they never even know they left the river at all, and it works. Every year, hundreds of thousands of Chinook, Coho, Steelhead, and Sockeye make their way past McNary Dam. If you include the non-native Shad, that number is in the millions. These Wait, good. Shad aren't native on the West Coast, but you guys have them? That's really funny. I didn't know you guys have invasive Shad. Because the Shad here are such like a nice protected part of the ecosystem. There are migratory fish. I didn't know that there was a place where they didn't want them. <laughs> And it's not just bony lamprey fish that find their way through. Some of the latest updates are to help lamprey passage. That's cool. I didn't think I would ever hear an engineer trying to make lamprey passage successful. In New Jersey, lamprey just typically don't care about the dams. They do this crazy like rock climbing thing where they suction onto the as long as it's low enough, like a crazy, you know, that a dam of this height, obviously they can't do this. But with our, like, mostly in New Jersey, we have little dams, like 10-foot dams maximum. They'll suck onto the side and then slowly, like, swim up suction, swim up suction, swim up suction to move their way up the dam. I've watched them do it in different parts of New Jersey. It's really cool. So McNary needs a way to get those juvenile fish through as well. That might sound simple. Thanks to gravity, it's much simpler to go down than up. But at a dam, it's anything but. And the way I explain to them is the adults are mission-oriented. They're coming back to spawn. Uh, the juveniles are just kind of dumb kids riding the wave. The <laughs> See, this is a, a brand new challenge that I wouldn't have thought about because the dams in New Jersey are small enough that, like, the fish can kind of just go over the top of them if they want to. There's some flow coming over the top of the dam, and so they can do that. I wonder if that's a behavior they already had or if there's some behavioral adaptation to human-built dams. There's no way. I think it's highly unlikely that how long have dams been properly around, like less than 200 years. I think it's highly unlikely that there has been a large behavioral adaptation in populations of migratory fish in that time. That seems very unlikely, especially in different parts of the world where those fish have been separated that entire duration. So when they're coming down, they're approaching the structure, uh, they, they got two basic paths to take, either the spillway or the power house. I definitely wouldn't want to pass through one of these, but juvenile fish can make it through the spillway mostly just fine. In fact, specialized structures are often installed. Yeah, this is in New Jersey. This is what I would expect. The dams are small enough that you can kind of just go over the spillway for the most part with no issue. Migration times to encourage fish to swim through the spillway. Many dams on the Columbia system have some way to spill water over the top called a weir that's more conducive to getting the juveniles through the dam. The other path for juveniles to take is to be drawn toward the turbines. But McNary and a lot of other dams are equipped with a sophisticated bypass system to divert the fish before they make it that far. Once the fish- Because a fish will pass into the turbine? Is that the issue? I hate that I'm saying turbine now. I used to say turbine and now I've been converted to saying turbine because I've heard so many people say it recently. I had a class recently where someone said it. Turbines are for wearing, turbines are for spinning. I don't know, I'm kind of coming around to calling it turbines. I never really had an opinion on how to pronounce it, but now I kind of do. Next, they flow into a huge pipe that pops out on the downstream face of the dam. Along the way, the juveniles pass through electronic readers that scan. I wonder if predatory fish have figured out that they can just sit under these and wait. Because actually they probably have figured that out. Now that I'm thinking about it, I have a friend who fished for musky and he fished for them right at the bottom of a spillway. That's gotta be because minnows will just like come over the spillway by accident and be free food, right? In many cases, most of the fish mortality caused by dams isn't the stress of getting them through the various structures, but simply that birds and other predatory fish take advantage of the fact that dams can slow down and concentrate migrating fish. This juvenile bypass pipe runs right out into the center of so the So if I just wait channel. at the bottom, I'll get free food? I mean, that seems to be the vibe. He's literally talking about how birds and probably fish predators as well will just sit at the bottom. Pike minnows not. have a bounty because they prey on juvenile salmon and dams give them an unnatural advantage. I did not know that. That's really cool. So they've even come up with fish power generators that can keep the tags running for much longer periods of time. A piezoelectric device creates power as the fish swims. And Bruh. 
the fish is swimming is powering the tag on the fish. That's some fun ways to test them out, too. Of course, migratory fish aren't the only part of the environment impacted by hydropower, and with all the competing interests, I don't think we'll ever feel like the issue is fully solved. That's pretty cool. Cool to learn about fish passages even in more in depth, because I've always felt like I wanted more time, effort, and resources put into them, but didn't exactly know the problem areas. Other than that, they just typically suck. So that was a cool video. Whoa.